Good morning, everyone. It's our pleasure to be here this morning. Beautiful New York City. To my left, we have Dr. James Malatras, who's been working on, among other things, the school reopening plan. Uh, and he's here to talk to us about that today. To my right, Melissa DeRosa, Secretary to the Governor. To her right, Rick Cotton, who is the head of the Port Authority, who's been doing an extraordinary job overall uh, building LaGuardia Airport, the first new airport in the United States in 25 years, uh, redoing John F. Kennedy Airport. And then if that wasn't enough, uh, he had to deal with something called uh, COVID, which uh, obviously impacted the airports. And he's, we are so lucky to have him. Uh, and I want to thank him very much for everything he's been doing. Uh, this morning, we're going to be joined by Mayor Bottoms, Mayor of Atlanta. Uh, and she's going to join us this morning. Good morning. How are you, Mayor? Good to be with you. I don't know if the audio is working, so I will buy some time. Uh, Mayor Bottoms, uh, we've been watching you. We're your neighbors to the north. Uh, and we've been watching you and what you've been going through. And uh, first, I hope you're feeling well, and I hope your fe family is feeling well. On top of everything, you have to be dealing with the COVID virus yourself. Uh, then you have your hands more than full there. You have not only the COVID virus, but the other virus of uh, racism and division uh, and what was going on with Mr. Brooks. But uh, we just want to tell you on behalf of New Yorkers after what we've gone through that uh, you are exactly right, Mayor, what you are saying and what you are advocating. You know, it's no longer a question of uh, theory or a question of politics. We have facts. We have data. Uh, we went through it here in New York. We went through it uh, in a worst-case scenario. Uh, and uh, it is about following the data and following the science and taking the precautions and doing what's right. Uh, it is about masks. Masks work. We can tell you that here in New York. We had the worst spike uh, per capita on the globe, and we brought it down. And now you see these other states are going higher than New York. So those masks work. We were the first state to start mandatory masks a April 15th. Uh, and all the science now says uh, for sure masks make a, a big difference. One of the models last week, the IHME model, it's the Gates-funded model that the White House uses, actually projected 40,000 more Americans will die if we don't have a national mask policy. So uh, it's clear. But uh, we just wanted to tell you that we feel for you. Uh, we are all one. We're one community. Uh, I applaud your leadership. You really get to see what an elected official is made of when the, when the pressure is on. Uh, and you have more than risen to the occasion. You've been inspiring. Uh, they refer to you as a rising star, and they are all correct. Uh, and we are with you. Anything we can do for you or the city, uh, we stand ready. We remember how good the people across this country were to us. When we were in the midst of it, I asked for volunteers from across the United States, nurses, doctors, to come help in our hospitals. 30,000 people uh, volunteered to come to New York in the midst of it and work in our hospitals. It was such an act of generosity and love uh, that it was really touching. So uh, we're here for you, the concept of pay forward. Uh, whatever we can do on any level, uh, we have people who've been through this and actually know, uh, and we stand ready. But you're right. Keep going. Stay strong. Uh, the facts will bear out. It's about saving lives, and you're doing exactly the right thing. And the numbers are going to show that. So thank you for taking some time to be with us today. Mayor. the country 
And at the beginning of this pandemic, my charge to my team was simple. God bless the child who's got its own. And I had no idea that we would have to go it alone in so many ways. I thought that it was more geared towards the lack of leadership we had at the federal level, but it has proven to be equally challenging at the statewide level. And my family is an example of what's happening across this country. We had an asymptomatic child in our home for eight days before we knew uh, that that child was asymptomatic. And by that time, my husband and I had contracted COVID unnecessarily, I would imagine, because we would have taken precautions to protect ourselves. Thankfully, by the grace of God, we don't have underlying health conditions and we are all on the men. My husband is feeling a lot better, but for so many people across this country, that is not their story and their outcome is so very different. So in Atlanta, uh, when we saw that we were in a very different place than the governor's leadership was taking us, we convened an advisory committee in our city comprised of health experts, small business owners, Fortune 500 representatives, colleges and universities, just really a representation of our community. And they made some very clear recommendations on where we needed to go with reopening a, a phased approach. We had made it into the second phase, but given where we are, um, our ICU bed capacity is maxed out in some hospitals by the day we're getting closer to maxing out in others. Our numbers are ticking up. I look at the numbers daily. I am seeing numbers that I have not seen since April. Um, as of yesterday afternoon, we were up almost 23% over a week's uh, period of time. We're headed in the wrong direction. So as a city, we've recommended that we go back to phase one, which is essentially a stay at home order. Also, we've instituted a mask mandate. Uh, the benefit of that is, is one, us taking a very clear position as a city that we recognize that masks wearing masks help save lives, but also even in the world's busiest airport, Hartsville Jackson Atlanta International Airport, one of our largest job centers, we can also mandate masks there as well. And it's very simple, unless we have a coordinated approach across this country, we are going to continue to unnecessarily watch people die and what makes it even more frustrating and, and even more disappointing. We didn't have to look to Italy we could look to New York and you told us very clearly that if we didn't do things differently in our cities and states, we would find ourselves in the same situation that New York was facing. And unfortunately, you were correct because throughout the South, especially, uh, we, are, we are getting there in rapid order. And so I, I thank you for your leadership. I know that as a city in the same way New York was able to get to the other side. I know that we will get to the other side, but it is going to take us taking responsibility for ourselves and, and taking actions that look at data and science and not just our opinions. Right. Thank, thank you very much, Mayor. And you're right. The unfortunate uh, and really frustrating point here is uh, why did other states have to go through this? I mean, we knew what we were dealing with. New York w went down the path before. Uh, we lived exactly this. Just learn from what New York did. Learn from the numbers, learn from the data. And we, we knew that if you reopen recklessly, the virus was going to take off again. If you're not doing precautions, the virus was going to take off. Uh, now, New York's problem is we have the infection coming from other states back to New York. We're worried about our infection rate going up uh, because of people coming from other states where the infection rate is higher. We have a, a cluster of cases in an upstate county called uh, Rensselaer. People came up from Georgia. They had the virus and they infected people uh, in New York, and then it, it took off. So you are, you are on exactly the right uh, track. Anything we can do to help, we're at a stable period now. We have the virus way down low. We went from the worst infection rate in the country to the 
best infection rate, the lowest. So uh, we have a little breathing space here. Anything we can do for you that you need, any uh, uh, help on the uh, testing, setting up the taste testing and the tracing, that is so, so important. Uh, and we've been through that. So you have an open offer, whatever you need, but uh, we're also 100% behind you. Uh, and we wish you Godspeed in your health recovering. Uh, and we hope that Atlanta, under your guidance, comes back quickly. And anything we can do, we stand ready. Thank you, Governor. And that's exactly what we need assistance with, uh, testing, uh, testing that gets people's results very quickly, and also the contact tracing, because we know that's extremely important for us to help slow the spread. So I appreciate your offer to help, and, and we certainly um, would be appreciative of that assistance. Well, we can do that. We have, uh, I'll, I'll arrange it uh, with, your, with your team, but we'll put together uh, people who have done the testing for us and the contact tracing. We actually worked with uh, Mike Bloomberg, former mayor of New York City. Uh, and because nobody knew what a contact tracing program was. And, and we worked with the former mayor who stepped up and brought Johns Hopkins to the table, and we came up with a training program and a whole software program. Uh, so I'll send the team down to Atlanta, uh, and they can work with uh, your people. And whatever we know and whatever we can share, uh, we will do. In the meantime, send my uh, regards to uh, the former mayor there who uh, I worked with, send my regards to uh, all the people at uh, Centen Centennial Park. When I was HUD secretary, I did a lot of work uh, in Atlanta, a lot of good work. I have a lot of fond memories. So send my regards to everyone. I'll get that team together, and they'll come down uh, to Atlanta as soon as it works for you. Thank you for being with Thank us, Mayor. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks. Okay. Godspeed to the mayor. Where are we? Today is day 135. Let's talk about some facts first. Where are we? 792 hospitalizations today. That is very good news, lowest since March 18th. You look at our rate of transmission all across the board, every region, we see good numbers. Uh, and again, we have more data than any state in the country. So. Uh, we live and die by the data, and all the numbers are good. You look across New York City, the county numbers, uh, they are all good and they are all consistent. Uh, you have a little deviation from day to day. That's statistically irrelevant, but uh, there's all good news in the numbers across the state and across the city. Uh, death toll for uh, yesterday is uh, 10 people. Again, We'd love to see that number at zero, but compared to where we have been, uh, that is a very good place to be. You look at the three-day average, and you see there the whole slope of what we've gone through. You see the descent, and uh, the experts say to me, you'll never really get to zero on the number of deaths. Uh, because people die. This is a condition like pneumonia. It attacks the respiratory system. Uh, so people who are very ill can uh, contract COVID and it can be the cause of death. But uh, that's where we are now. We did 51,000 tests yesterday and it was just over 1%. So it was all good news on where uh, we are as a state. And uh, the numbers show that what we have done in terms of our reopening strategy and our plan has worked. We have been reopening for weeks now. Over one month we started uh, reopening. And we expected, after the reopening, we expected the numbers to tick up. They haven't picked up. They've actually gone down. So the reopening strategy has worked. New York State SMART has worked, and it shows that this nation can defeat COVID. There was no reason to have these states on the increase. New York inherited a spike. Remember where we started. We were handed 
this high infection rate because nobody knew the virus had come from Europe. So we started with a high spike. We had to get that spike down. The other states didn't start with the spike. They just had to stop it from increasing. Uh, and with all we did in New York and all we knew, they were just blind to the reality. And again, I want to congratulate New Yorkers who really stepped up to, to the plate and they did what they had to do. And it was hard. Social distancing, closed businesses, closed schools, stay at home. It was hard. But they did it. We now get to the question of reopening schools. There is a state formula that will determine if it is safe to reopen schools, okay? So open schools or not, there's a state formula that determines it. There are then state guidelines as to, as to how that school reopens, right? State formula determines if it reopens. If it reopens, the second question is how, and that will be done by state guidelines. Uh, but the question of school opening is like the question of reopening the economy, reopening the schools, reopening the economy. It's the same conversation. And by the way, it's the exact same conversation with the President of the United States. We talked about reopening the economy, and he said, just reopen. Just reopen the economy. There's no reason for any of this stuff, phases, data, masks. It's all baloney. Just reopen. Yeah, we saw how well that worked. Go ask Florida and Texas and Arizona how well that worked. On schools, what does he say? Reopen the schools. Just open them up. Don't worry. Yeah, he was wrong on the economic reopening. He's wrong on the schools reopening. Everybody wants to reopen the schools. I want to reopen the schools. Everybody wants to reopen the schools. It's not do we reopen or not. You reopen if it is safe to reopen. How do you know if it's safe? You look at the data. You don't hold your finger up and feel the wind. You don't have an inspiration. You don't have a dream. You don't have an emotion. Look at the data. We test more. We have more data than any state. Look at the data. If you have the virus under control, reopen. If you don't have the virus under control, then you can't reopen, right? We're not going to use our children uh, as a litmus test, and we're not gonna, going to put our children in a place where their health is endangered. It's that simple. Common sense and intelligence can still determine what we do, even in this crazy environment. Uh, we're not going to use our children as guinea pigs. I say to the experts, it's very simple. If I'm making the determination as to whether or not I would send my daughter to school. If it's safe, I'll send her. If it's not safe, I'm not going to send her. And you can determine that by science. So the formula is this. Schools will reopen if that region is in phase four and the daily infection rate remains 5% or lower over a 14-day average, okay? You're in phase four and you're under 5% infection rate. That means the virus is under control. That means it's safe to reopen. And then the schools can proceed to reopening in that region. Exactly how you look at the state guidelines. This determination will be made the first week in August. Second question is, what happens if between the first week in August and the day school opens, the virus spikes? I don't want to be in a position where we made a determination August 7th and then the virus spikes, but we already said the schools are going to reopen. So the safety valve, there's a floor. Schools will close 
if the regional infection rate is above 9% on a seven-day average, okay? So you get a green light, reopen in a region if you're in phase four and the infection rate is 5% or lower. If the infection rate goes over 9% on a seven-day average, that means the virus is uh, moving rapidly and it is not intelligent to open. That's the green light and that's the red light and it's the way we've done the economic reopening, it's purely on the numbers purely on the numbers, it's on the science. We'll make the first decision, we'll look at the numbers, the week of August uh, 1 to 7, the week because it's a rolling 14-day average, different regions are in different positions uh, on the 14-day average. Between August 1st, you get a green light on August 1st, between August 1st and the day the school opens, we continue to monitor every day. And if the infection rate goes over nine, then uh, we hit an emergency stop button, okay? Uh, it's very simple, it's clear. Once you get a green light to reopen, then how you reopen, you follow the guidelines and we leave it to the 700 school districts across the state to come up with the specific plan pursuant to those guidelines. We have done state health guidelines. Uh, the State Department of Education is doing state education guidelines which will incorporate our health guidelines. We had a great uh, Reimagine Education Advisory Council that did a lot of work to come up with the guidelines. Uh, Jim Malatras ran it for me. I want to thank them all very much for the good work they did. They're education officials from all across the state. Uh, they came up with guidelines that will say the districts have to have flexible plans, they have to be safeguards, they're prioritizing safety, maximizing available space, focusing on arts, career, technical education. They have to be innovative. Uh, how do you use remote learning? How do you use innovative models, best practices? Uh, and all the guidelines will be up today. We want masks and PPE whenever students or staff cannot maintain social distancing. Masks work. They work for children, they work for teachers, they work for everyone. Uh, we have social distancing, six feet separations, we have cohort structures in the guidelines, uh, guidelines on transportation, food service, aftercare, extracurricular activities. Uh, every child and person entering will be screened. Uh, Tracing has to work in the schools, cleaning and closure procedures. Uh, that's all in the guidelines. And again, we've done the health guidelines, uh, State Department of Education, uh, which I do not run, it's a separate agency. They'll do the education guidelines incorporating ours. Well then what's the bad news? All our numbers are good. All our numbers are good. Bad news is uh, we have to keep them that way. Uh, and there are challenges. There are two threats. First is lack of compliance by New Yorkers. We get arrogant, we get cocky, weather's warm, the numbers are good. I heard the governor, he said everything was good, there's nothing to worry about. I never said there's nothing to worry about. I never said that. I said the numbers are good. Uh, I worry every day. Well, you just worry a lot. No, I'm not really a worrier by nature. The circumstances cause me to worry. We have to remain compliant. And the local governments have to do their job and enforce compliance. Well, it's hard with younger people. I understand. Well, p some people don't like to wear a mask. I understand. Well, socially distancing is difficult. I understand. We have to do it. If you don't do it, the virus will increase. Period. Period. I mean, this is, I'm not, this is not my opinion. I'm not guessing. We know it as a scientific fact. That's uh, the first threat. Second is the virus comes to New York. And this is a very real threat. Uh, and it is deja vu all over again. 
the first federal debacle was losing track of the virus that was supposed to be in China and not knowing it left China and it went to Europe and then it came here from Europe. And the federal government has now admitted this. It was one of the great federal blunders in history cost thousands of lives in New York and billions of dollars. They just missed it. Yeah. It was a terrible miss and a terrible mistake, and it's what created the spike in New York. The second federal mistake is even after everything we went through, they allowed and pushed the other states to reopen recklessly, and you now have the virus out of control in other states, and it's going to fly back to New York. The first mistake brought it from Europe to New York. The second mistake will bring it from Georgia to New York and Texas to New York and Arizona to New York and the 38 states that see the virus going up. Both times, New York did nothing wrong. It was the federal government that caused our problem and then, frankly, wanted to have nothing to do with the solution. They caused the problem, and then they said, you're on your own. Literally, you have 39 states that are now seeing the virus increase and come to New York. So we talk about the valve. I talk about the valve, the reopening valve. And we talked about monitoring it all along. You now have to add two additional measures or dials to the valve. One is now you have to watch the effect of noncompliance and make sure the local governments are doing their job. The second dial is now the effect of the national outbreak and people coming here to New York with the virus. Those are the two new complications that have been added to the mix. And look, it is the federal government because it is the federal government. Sometimes it is what it is. And this has been gross negligence they have been denying the reality of the situation from the beginning. It doesn't exist. It's going to go away. By Easter, we'll reopen. When it gets warm, it will go away like it's a miracle. It didn't go away. There was no miracle. You denied reality. This is their political agenda over public health policy. That's what this is. This is politically inconvenient in an election year. So deny it. Yeah. Except you are jeopardizing public health and you're losing lives by your denial and your political agenda. And then when the federal government didn't step up and handle this, this was a federal crisis. Why is New York State or the state of Georgia, or the state of California, or any of these states handling the COVID virus. It's a national issue. The president did a federal emergency declaration. You know what a federal emergency declaration means? It means a federal emergency. You know who's in charge of federal emergencies? The federal government. That's why they use the word federal in all of those expressions. I was in the federal government. When there's a federal emergency, it's the responsibility of the federal government. They just abandoned their post and said it's up to the states. And by the way, they got offended when the states asked for any resources or help from the federal government. If they're not going to step up and address a problem that helps every, that hurts every state in the United States, then what is the point of the federal government? I mean, if you don't see that as your role, what is the role? And now the president is attacking science. What a surprise, no surprise. He's been attacking science from day one. The denial of reality 
was to deny science. And he's done that from day one. At the end of the day, science trumps politics. Politics does not trump science. You don't defeat a virus with politics. You defeat a virus by using science and medicine. That was true from day one. The president now says his own health officials are lying about the virus. His own CDC health officials are lying about the virus. Well, if the president is telling the truth, you know what he should do? He should fire them. He should fire them. You know what I would do if I believed my health commissioner was lying? I would fire him. If I said in this room, my health commissioner is lying about the coronavirus, you know what your first question would be? Governor, if he, you say he's lying, how do you not fire him? How do you keep him in charge of health policy if you say the person is lying? Because someone is clearly lying to the American people. And people are dying because of it. Trump's COVID scandal makes what Nixon did at Watergate look innocent. Nobody died in the Watergate scandal. Thousands of people are going to die in this COVID scandal. And that is all the difference in the world. You look at the facts, the facts clearly demonstrate Trump was wrong from day one. And New Yorkers have been right from day one. There's no argument. There's nothing to tweet about. The facts are in. The numbers are in. Look at the number of bodies. Look at the infection rate. New York's numbers have declined while the nation is going up. New York is down 70%. These other states, up over 800%. Florida, up 1,300%. Who's right, who's wrong? What's there to argue about? Those are the numbers. Tell me the numbers are wrong. It's all across the country, and it is undeniable. And it's now a threat to the state of New York. We have done a quarantine for the highest risk infection states. We know there have been instances of noncompliance. Noncompliance can lead to outbreaks. We're seeing it in Rensselaer County now where people came up from Georgia. We're going to have the Department of Health issue an emergency health order today that will mandate that out-of-state travelers from the states that are quarantined must provide uh, a location form before they leave the airport. The airlines will hand it out on the plane. It will also be available on the web. You can fill, fill it out electronically, or you have to fill out the piece of paper on the airplane. You must give officials at the airport your form as to where you came from and where you're going before you leave the airport. It will be enforced in every airport in the state of New York. Downstate, the Port Authority will enforce it. If you leave the airport without providing the information, you will receive a summons immediately with a $2,000 fine. If you leave the airport without filling out uh, the information, not only can you have a $2,000 fine, you can then be brought to a hearing and ordered to, comp 
complete mandatory quarantine, okay? None of this is pleasant, but we've gone through this before. We went through this when Rick Cotton and people at the Port Authority watched three million Europeans, people from Europe, come into this state and bringing the virus. Fool me once. We can't be in a situation where we have people coming from other states in the country bringing the virus again. Uh, it is that simple. Again, Port Authority will do the enforcement in downstate New York. The other airports will do it in upstate New York. The general point is we have to stay diligent. New Yorkers have been truly amazing. And what they did was historic. They tamed the beast because they are New York tough, which means smart, united, disciplined, and loving. Those were the facts. I now want to give you an opinion. In this case, it's a very personal opinion. Personal opinion, but very personal. There's personal, but then there's like very personal, which is even more personal than just personal. We went through 11 days of hell. Uh, everybody processed it their own way. I saw it as climbing a mountain, and you had to climb that mountain every day, and every day was hard, and every day climbing the mountain, you didn't even know how high the mountain was. And at the same time, you were designing the mountain because our behavior was going to design the mountain and design the plateau and the peak. When will the virus stop? when you stop the virus, is what the experts would say to me. It was like a cruel riddle every day. When do the deaths stop? When does the infection rate stop? When you stop it. What does that mean? When the, socially, the social distancing works, when the closed down policies work, when the masks work. So you're climbing a mountain and you are designing the curve of the mountain. It ends when you say it ends, right? This was traumatizing for people. And uh, on a personal level, economic level, it was frightening, it was isolating. Uh, everyone had their own demons they were dealing with. I had my own demons and my own fears. I'm afraid for my mother, afraid for my kids, afraid for my brother, everyone had their own pain and their own trauma to deal with. But what we went through and what we did was historic because we did tame the beast. We did turn the corner. We did plateau that mountain. And then we came down the other side. And they will be talking about what we did for decades to come. It really was an historic moment personally traumatic, socially uh, traumatic, and historic. So, I love history. I love uh, poster art. Poster art is something they did uh, in the early 1900s, late 1800s, when they had to communicate their whole platform candidacy on one piece of paper, right? Uh, you wanted to run a campaign. They didn't have the TV commercials. They didn't have mail. They didn't have any of these things. So they got their whole message on one piece of paper. And it always fascinated me. I used so many words. What if somebody said, okay, no words. Paint me a picture that tells the story of what you're trying to say. That's poster art. And it's helped me because it's been like a relief valve. Uh, not that I don't have joy every day dealing with you guys, but I could go and just use a different side of my brain. Uh, and this was the m most famous, the uh, William Jennings Bryan with the octopus. He's fighting the octopus, and the octopus is corporate trusts that are taking over the economy, right? You could almost do that again today. So. Over the past few years, I've done my own uh, posters on that capture that feeling. I did this one for the state of the state, ship of state, 
that was sailing in this sea of division, right, uh, back in January. Well, in any event, so I did a new one for uh, what we went through with COVID. And I think the general shape is familiar to, to you. We went up the mountain, we curved the mountain, we came down the other side, uh, and these are little telltale signs that, uh, to me, represent what was going on. That big arrow that goes right up through it, that was the economic models, right? We needed 120,000 beds, we needed 140,000 beds, and those models shot straight up. We had to bend the curve despite those models. We needed 30,000 ventilators, that model said. We almost get to the top of the mountain, economy falls, get it, economy falls like Niagara Falls, but then, then the economy drops, the economy falls, and uh, the economy comes running down. Timeline on the bottom, from day one to day 111, uh, it's roughly scaled. And then little visuals of what was going on. Starts on day one, little octopuses to tell, back to the William Jennings Bryan poster. Zach got that right away. First comes on a cruise ship, the COVID virus, right? We start the daily briefings. It's Jim Malatris and Stephanie Benton. Hand sanitizer. We have the winds of fear are blowing. Everybody's afraid. We have the plane bringing three million people from Europe, and that's how COVID came through the clouds of the federal government, CDC, et cetera. Testing hospital surge, Javits Center, we're pulling down the curve together, right? 111 days of hell, the New Rochelle hotspot, first hotspot cluster, testing, tracing, nasal swab, cute little button nose. I'm driving once again, one of the few benefits of this. I get to drive myself now subway disinfection, we've turned the corner, mask up, social distancing, the sun is on the other side of the mountain, we just had to make it to the other side of the mountain, there's the man in the moon, it's just the flu, phase one, we're now coming down the other side, boyfriend Cliff is there, tell the people the truth, they will do the right thing, they made the boyfriend look like uh, Zach Fink. I'm not sure why. <laughs> Who's pulling down the curve? New Yorkers? Healthcare workers? The essential workers? Out of state volunteers. 30,000 people from out of state volunteer to come help us. I have my three daughters there. That's Captain. They have him a little paunchy. He's on a diet. He's not that bad, but he's on his way. Stock market reopens. We come down the other side. There's the briefing table. Out of state ban. Follow the facts. It's Arizona, Texas, Florida going up. Last little sign, caution ahead, caution ahead. We climb the mountain, we're down the mountain. Be cautious, what we're talking about today. Do compliance, watch people from other states, and we're still in the sea of division, which I talked about in January. Uh, even worse, George Floyd murder, racial tension, protests, even worse than it was. So, New York tough, smart, united, disciplined, loving, in case you haven't heard that before, because love wins at the end of the day. Love is the rainbow. Timeline on the bottom. We forged community, and community wins. And you were part of it. And I'm going to give you a poster, because you were a part of it.